Um, we're going to go ahead and start out with some introductions. Um, I'm Nathan Weaver. I'm a video production specialist with the Video Communications Center. Uh, Rafe Preston. Rachel Robertson. Michelle Namer. And uh, we're going to go ahead and pass around the room real quick and uh, to our people that are in distance as well. Uh, get some introductions. So we'll go ahead and start on the right over here. And uh, we'll go through name, your work, uh, in your department, that sort of thing. And then if you're, whether you're new to distance education or returning, and then uh, kind of what, what brought you here to the open house. So. Uh, Dan Other, I'm uh, the Mathis Chair in the Department of Civil Engineering. I've been at SMT for five weeks, and I saw your email. All right. Great. Nice to meet you. And I'm Ronaldo Luna, uh, I'm a civil, and um, do a lot of distance. I want to see what, how the HD looks, and uh, I heard you guys have good food, so I <laughs> <laughs> You heard right. That is true. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and go back first. Uh, Roger Sorry. Bunn. Math, uh, mathematics department. I'm following my advisor around. Uh, I'm Matt Insall, mathematics, because I'm following my graduate student around. <laughs> but uh, I'll also, I've taught uh, uh, my mathematical logic class twice using VCC, and I want to see more about what you've got to offer and updates and so forth. So. I'm BJ Stressler in electrical computer. Um, I'm new to this thing. Right. I just wanted to see what I can learn. All right. Well, hopefully you will learn something. <laughs> I'm Barry Flaxport, the Information Science and Technology Program within the Business and Information Technology. I've been using VCC since a long, long, long time ago, uh, remotely and from here, et cetera. And my primary purpose for coming is to make sure that Ross behaves himself. So I'm going to sit here and make sure he does Please, that. Please, thank, thank you. Yeah. 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 I, I guess I want, to, I want to make a comment since he's here. Um, uh -oh. I've, I've used VCC extensively all the time, and I have never, ever, ever encountered anything other than superlative service from your people. I don't know how you do it or how you hire people or what, but you get the most outstanding people, and they do a fabulous job. Thank you very here, much. Here, here. Wow. Thank you. It must be good. Oh, blushing. <laughs> it must be good. Our philosophy is meetings will continue. And yeah. uh, I would just want to say that Barry uh, definitely uses the VCC, no, in a good way. So he, he, he trusts us and lets us do our job, but we, he takes our input and we give him input, he gives us input, and it's like a happy family. And I'm Ross Hazelhorst, director of the Video Communication Center. Um, in I, I should also say that uh, one of the reasons I'm here today is to see if you guys have an update on how Kayla and her baby are doing. Oh. They, they are doing good. Good. Kayla's yeah. back at work with us. I yeah. haven't seen her since, well, I saw her when, when she brought the baby to campus, but I didn't see her since then. She just started back this week. Good. good. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's one of the All right. And uh, somebody just snuck in the back of the room. So. <laughs> will force them to introduce themselves. My name is Bill Brown. I'm one of the VPSs that works for the VCC. Uh, so he's like us, <laughs> the used one, one of the used ones. <laughs> so um, we're going to go ahead and we've got some people in distance. Um, mm -hmm. Over Polycom, if you'd want to bring up Polycom on the front monitors here for a minute, um, we've got Debbie Beninati. And uh, go ahead. Hi, I'm Debbie Beninati, Education Program Specialist at the EEC, the Engineering Education Center in St. Louis. And we connect with her up there at EEC a lot. We have some mm -hmm. professors up there, and sometimes we have students coming to us from up there, and vice versa. So, Yes. Um, we're going to go ahead and direct our attention to online here. We've got a few people, as you can see, online. Um, we're going to start with Debbie. Yes, this is Debbie, and I work for the Video Communications Center, and I am doing a simulation of what a distance student uh, would sound like and what they will see and what they will hear. All right. And Thanks. she is coming to us over the phone today. Yes. Thank you, Debbie. Um, I'm going to go ahead to Private Larry Smith, since 
uh, Erickson is not on audio yet. So, Hi, uh, my name is actually Joel Goodridge, and I'm a video professional uh, with the VCC. And just today I'm going to be playing the role of a distance student, Private Larry Smith. Uh, distance students uh, often, uh, when they're in locations such as Iraq and other places, aren't available to listen to class live. Uh, they often listen to recordings, but today Larry Smith is with you. So, uh, and Erickson is not on audio just yet. He just got in, so we'll give him a minute real quick while we do some preliminary admin announcement. They always kind of delay things. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, um, uh, as we've noted, uh, I think everybody has a program that you can take notes in the program uh, via uh, for each presentation as we go through. Uh, we're going to move through uh, several short presentations and it'll be about 20-30 minutes and then we'll go ahead and take uh, questions and a little break at that point. So that way if you take notes then you'll remember what you wanted to ask and if you absolutely have to ask a question as we're going we'll allow it. But, um, <laughs> uh, we figured we would try to, do, because of the time restraints on our presentations, we try to just go through them and then take questions. But um, hopefully that will help you not forget what you wanted to ask. Um, Kelvin Erickson, can you hear us online? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Uh, okay, we were doing introductions uh, just before you got on the audio. Uh, who you are, which obviously we know your name, Kelvin Erickson. <laughs> uh, uh, what you do, where you work, the department, and then uh, whether you're new to distance education and what brought you to the open house today. And you're up. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he got disconnected. I think he's down. He would, but, uh, oh, I'm just I'm just watching to see what the WebEx is like from the student standpoint. All uh, right. And are you new to distance education? Or uh, yes and no. <laughs> I haven't done it myself, but okay. I've used I used some of the WebEx conferencing facilities before. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and make one more quick announcement, and then we're going to jump into the presentations. So um, uh, just the last thing to mention is that we're, we're going to record the presentations today so we can post them online afterwards. Um, uh, so since we're recording and uh, we have people connected live, we're going to ask if you would please switch off your cell phones so that we don't get interference. Uh, for the, for the people online and for the recordings. But, um, and then uh, that's the last thing we'll say. And then we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Rafe. And he's going to go ahead and start us off. Mm -hmm. Looks like Kelvin wasn't muted either. Sorry. All right. All right. Well, welcome to the Media Communications Center open house. Um, I'm going to start it off today, just give you guys a brief overview of what we're going to cover. Um, I'll be talking about a little bit of the, the history of the VCC and well, where we're at today. Um, I'm going to talk about how we're staying ahead of the competition and tell you guys some of the advantages of teaching a distance course through the, v the VCC. Then Michelle's going to come up and kind of give you a tour of the room, show you around here. And then uh, Nathan's going to come up and navigate our website for you, show, show you how to get to the archive files, <clears throat> and then uh, we'll take a short break. If you have some questions then we can try and address those. But we're wanting just kind of a five, ten minute break there, <clears throat> and then we'll get back into the presentation. Nathan's going to come up and uh, show you some of the features of WebEx, and then we're going to finish it off with uh, Rachel explaining how you can use Blackboard with your class here. And then we'll open it up for more extensive discussions and questions. So the video communications has been around for about 20 plus years. We just started out as uh, we filmed the the class or we filmed um, the classes and made uh, VHSs that were just uh, distributed out. And then uh, we we kind of made a big step in in the live um, collaborative realm whenever we went to uh, satellite feeds. Uh, 
that was just kind of a one-way thing. We sent the, the satellite feeds out so that people could uh, see live what was going on. But satellite what isn't real reliable, especially when it comes to uh, storms and stuff like that. So now today we've upgraded to a collaborative software called WebEx. And um, that's what we're using right now. And we're able to share the, uh, what you're displaying here on the computer, what you're displaying here in class um, to your distant students. And then uh, also with this uh, software, they can join the teleconference or the VoIP audio, and they're able to uh, talk to you if they have questions during class. So they're just a lot more engaged, and it's, uh, it's really just a real-time par participation of your class, basically like they're here. And then at the same time, we are in the back here uh, recording the lecture, and we post those up for archiving after the class is done. So if your students can't make it live, then they, they can still view your class after the fact. How we stay ahead of the competition, we're um, keeping up with quality standards of today. Uh, everything's going HD, and this is our first HD room. As you can see, we got the big HD monitors. Uh, we have HD cameras, and um, we're encoding in, in a higher quality. And just with the, because of the WebEx software we use, um, it allows for a lot more flexibility than most distance classes. So it's great for both full-time students and uh, working professionals. And our, our main job here at the VCC is just uh, to make distance education as easy as it can be for both you, the professors, and your students. <coughs> so how do we stay ahead? Uh, like I mentioned, this is our first HD room, Tumi 260. We've produced two semesters out of here, and things are going great. This summer, we've been through the process of upgrading EECH 239, Library G14, and Fulton 107A all to HD rooms. And we do have plans uh, in the future to finish up with the rest of our rooms, converting them to HD. Uh, you'll hear us talking about synchronous, synchronous a lot, and that's just the, the live participating of your class. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we use that program called WebEx so that your distant students can participate live. And they will join the, they will either call in and join the teleconference or use a computer head, headset over VoIP uh, so that they can participate live in class. And there's also a feature uh, built within WebEx so that they can chat um, either to you, to us back in the, in the control room, or to other students. And so because of this software and stuff, it's, it's just basically like they're participating live in your class like they're any other student uh, taking part in your class. And, and also while we're... We're also um, recording, or not recording, we're doing Windows Media Streaming in the back so that maybe a student doesn't want to go through uh, all the hassle. Well, it's not really a hassle, but they, they don't want to go into, uh, uh, log into WebEx. They can just watch the live streaming and they, they can, um, it's just uh, an easier way to just see the class live without having to go through any of the steps of actually joining live. And I, I will note that the live streaming is usually about 30 seconds behind the actual live class. And then um, recently WebEx has um, made it to where um, there, there are many smartphones now that you can use to join uh, live during class as well, as well as iPod Touches and the iPhone. And then asynchronous is the archiving that we do here. We, rec we record in two main formats, the WMV, which is the Windows Media Video file, and the ARF, which is the native WebEx file. And we can make these um, files downloadable for your students. So uh, many times we have students that um, don't have a really good, solid uh, internet connection. So the st when they try to stream the stuff over the internet, it doesn't work out real well. So they'll ask to be able to download your files. That way they can just download it however long it takes, and then whenever they have time, some free time, they'll watch it then. They can, 
Also, if they are traveling a lot, then they can download it to their computer and then watch it on a, on a plane ride or something. And um, also, those downloads can be made available for the iPod and other video capable uh, media players. So here are some of the advantages of teaching a distance education class through the VCC. Um, obviously, there's lots of different uh, learning styles. But uh, as, as I've mentioned earlier, because we do both the asynchronous and the synchronous um, class, then it, it's just uh, more flexible for all those different styles of learning. But we feel that the, um, having that classroom feel is an easier way to, uh, for your students to learn. And even the archiving that we do still has more of a classroom feel because the class is being recorded live. So you do have the participation of your, of your in-class students if you have any, and also other distance students if they want to chime in. So it's just even the, the recordings that we, we make just have that more live feel. Now if you happen to be traveling, um, because of WebEx, if you have an internet connection and a phone or a computer headset, you can teach wherever you are. So you'll, you would never have to miss a class if you're, if you're traveling. You could just log into WebEx and join the uh, audio conference and teach from wherever you are. Um, we've had many teachers that have taught from like hotel rooms and the airport and you know just wherever they happen to be. But we do realize that if you are traveling, maybe you don't want to have to go through the hassle of um, teaching in class while you're on the road. Or maybe you're on vacation and you just don't want to be bothered. So um, if, if that is the case, you can set up a pre-record with us. And we'll record before, your class, before the class date that you're going to miss. And we can display the uh, recording here in classroom for your on-campus students if you'd like us to do that. Or we'll just post it online at, at a certain date that you want us to, and they can view it then. Now, if you happen to have an unexpected cancellation, if you get sick or just uh, miss a day, you can also set up a post record with us so that you don't fall behind on the coursework you're trying to cover through the semester. So we'll just post the, the post recording up online after the class that you missed, and you can tell your students, go check this recording out. So, you, so you're up to date for the next class period. And then also it's, it can be good for your in-class students if they have um, an absence where they can't make it to your class, then you can have them go and look at your, the recording that we made for that day so that they aren't falling behind on your coursework as well. And um, as you can see, we've gotten rid of the chalkboards. We no longer have any chalkboards or whiteboards in any of our rooms. Um, we've gone all digital. We use a program called OneNote. And it's just, we feel it's a lot easier than uh, having to write on a chalkboard and having to erase equations all the time. Uh, with this program, you can just continually write and write. And also, you can save your, um, your notes and stuff after, after class is done so you, you're not missing all of the material that would be on the chalkboard. You'll actually have it saved. Um, you can have that saved as a PDF. So you can post that on, on Blackboard for your students if you, if you want them to have access to that. And then lastly is the HD quality playback of our classes. Um, obviously, if, if, you're, if the quality of the recording is kind of subpar, especially whenever you have very text heavy um, PowerPoints, then viewing those slides can be very difficult if you don't have a good quality encoding. So we're recording at, at a good quality, and it just helps your students be able to see and, and learn better. So, And finally, we're always open for suggestions. We do have a suggestion box in the back of the classroom. So give us your feedback and suggestions. We want to make distance education uh, the best it can be. I'm going to hand it over to Michelle. Yes. Do you want to ask questions now or hold them all to the end? We'd or? like to, if you could hold it to the kind of, kind of midpoint break, that would be good. Because some of your questions may be covered here with some of the rest of the presentation. Michelle's going to give you a tour of the room.
out of chat real quick. Check that out. Ah, saying good morning. Okay, uh, so let's get back into the presentation. You heard a little bit about what the VCC or who the VCC is and kind of like what we do. Let's see how it works. <laughs> uh, the main difference for a video classroom is the green screen behind me. As you can see, this, uh, this gives us the ability to put your presentation behind you. The side monitors allow you, as we got to show everyone online, allows you the ability to point to your text or to a picture or there's one over here so you can go over this way if you're left-handed. Uh, this is exactly what the weatherman does every day on the news. They have side monitors that help them orient themselves to where they need to point. And uh, you may feel like you'd want to go over to the big monitor because that's the most obvious place where your uh, material would be. Uh, that's probably not advised because it doesn't look well on uh, the video. We have cameras in the rooms that help capture what is going on and that is where the video production specialist comes in in the control room. We have the ability to uh, change inputs so that uh, the, um, that's being broadcast over the internet. Now, um, you may be concerned that uh, how can your off-campus students hear you? As you can see, we are wearing microphones, and that's how your off-campus students can hear you. Uh, same thing goes for your uh, on-campus students. If they have a question or if they uh, want to answer a question, they have microphones on their desk so that the off-campus students can hear them. Now, as you heard with the introductions, uh, you can hear your off-campus students through the speakers in the ceiling. Now, um, I know I've, I've heard people comment about the monitors. Uh, the monitors are for your on-campus students' benefit so that they don't have to strain to read the PowerPoint slides. And we have the ability, the video production specialists have the ability to switch the monitor inputs. So whatever is needed, it's either program as we were, uh, the computer, or polycom. As you can see, we changed the inputs. It's all about what uh, is best for your students to, to see the material. The polycom can be used if you have any distance students who um, have access to video conferencing. Uh, we've had students before in the past in St. Louis who uh, wanted to dial in and uh, participate in class using the television screen instead of joining WebEx. Uh, we, t we usually have distance professors. We do, as you can see, the room right there, or, well, in the back. Uh, <laughs> um, that's a room in St. Louis that we have several rooms in St. Louis that professors teach from there to students in Rolla. So uh, we have an also, a, you can't see it right now, but that square up there is a projector. It's, it's in, the, in the ceiling. Uh, it can come down, and there's a screen that comes down that uh, we can uh, put polycom in so the students can watch them in the middle of the room and not the, you know, have an input on one of the sides. Um, and the back monitors, as I pointed out before, uh, that one big one is for polycom because whenever students give presentations, it's kind of easier on them that they can look in the back and see the professor and not uh, want to turn or do something like that and kind of awkwardness. Uh, and the other uh, program, um, excuse me, the other uh, monitor is for program. That allows you to see what is being broadcast over the internet. Now, um, there may be a situation in your class uh, where you want to maybe show a object or uh, a textbook. We have this program called uh, Averivision which is the, an overhead camera. So we open up the software so your on-campus students and your off-campus students can see it. You can show the object, and then if you want to pass it along to your on-campus students, you can. But that benefits that your off-campus students can see it. 
Now we also, you know, if you have a textbook that you want to just show your students something, it has the ability to zoom in. So you can show what uh, uh, part of the textbook you're, you want your students to see. Now, uh, Rafe mentioned before, we have no uh, chalkboards or whiteboards. Uh, we have replaced it with this uh, monitor called Wacom. It's an uh, interactive monitor, and you have the ability to write on it. Now, I've taken uh, some slides from uh, a, another professor's uh, lecture just to emphasize what you can do. You know, you can put whatever you want. You can select pen, and you can also choose your uh, colors as well, and just write. And um, net, it, you can, you know, this is the previous one I had, and you can just direct your students' attention on where you want them to look using the Wacom. Or have a blank slide and just write your equations or your notes for the students. Uh, now, uh, you may not like how the uh, screen is angled, but you have the ability to adjust it to make it comfortable for you. Now, whenever you're done with your notes in PowerPoint and you leave the slide show, it will ask you if you want to keep or discard your notes. Now, if you want to keep them and save them and you can upload your PowerPoints again into Blackboard so your students can see your new notes, or if you don't want that, just say discard and they're gone. Now we're going on to OneNote. <laughs> OneNote is pretty much a big notebook. This is what I did a few um, days ago just to show you what OneNote can do. This is on your computers and you can play with it as much as you like. Uh, this is the blank screen right now uh, and so you can see the pages on the side that I've made. You can have, you can name your tabs by subject, your lecture, the date of the lecture, or uh, anything you want. And you have the ability to have different backgrounds. This is college rule, this is medium grid, this is small grid. You have pins on the side, you have uh, different shapes and angles and everything you can do on here. And uh, it saves it all. It saves it for the next time you come by. So uh, once you're done with your notes, you can export them to PDF and then upload them to Blackboard. Now, um, we showed you a lot. Uh, there's always a video production specialist in the back. So if you have any questions or have any concerns, we are here to help. And at the end of the semester, if you're in an HD room, you have the ability to, um, well, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, you will get a disk of uh, high quality Win Media. Uh, files and also the ARF WebEx files. So um, that was a quick of what the room ha uh, can do for you. And here's Nathan with uh, guiding you through our website and later on WebEx. And uh, when I finish up with this presentation, this is, this is when we'll take the questions. So I'm going to, uh, oops, move back out of that. I'm going to start us by going to our website. Um, I'm going to be kind of looking at the end result of what Michelle just talked about. She talked about kind of what's going on inside the classroom, and I'm going to take us to the website and look at what it looks like uh, while it's happening and, and uh, how to get to things, to look at things when things are live and how to look at things when, when they're archived. So uh, we're going to head to our website, which is vcc.mst.edu. And I'm going to go ahead and scroll down here to this quick link section. And um, we're going to go ahead and start with this uh, Watch Class Live link. And this will take us to what we refer to as the as live pages. And um, I'm going to go ahead and click on distance on education under the summer semester for an example. And your students could come here and scroll down the page to their class. 
and um, pick out a class here by Victor Bierman. And um, as you can see at the top of the page, there's kind of some course information, and a course syllabus, and then some contact information for Dr. Bierman. Uh, we're going to spend most of our time kind of looking down here at the bottom of the page. Uh, we're going to start here with the live streaming video. The first thing here is this Windows Media link, and that's that Windows Media live streaming video that uh, Rafe mentioned. Uh, so when class is live, your students can come to their class page here, and they can click on this Windows Media link, and it'll open up the, the Windows Media player and play, play the live stream. Uh, next to that is this WebEx link, which will take you to the uh, Missouri S&T WebEx site so that students can join your WebEx session when class is live and they can get into the audio conference and they can get into uh, uh, look at your presentation live while it's happening. Um, we also have here course archives. First thing is this S&T archives link and that's going to take you to a page on our website which has the, uh, the Windows Media video recordings that were made. Um, you can also find them right here at the bottom of the page. They appear here automatically in this little table and you can see each class is just named by the date of the lecture. And so they can come down here and click on the date that they need to watch. And then that'll open the Windows Media video recording and play it over the web. Uh, the next thing is this WebEx link. And that's going to take you to the Missouri S&T WebEx site, but it's going to take you to a different page on the WebEx site. And that's where the WebEx recordings are stored. Um, I'm actually not going to go to the WebEx site right now because we'll be looking at the WebEx site after questions and break in a little bit, so I'm not going to go ahead and click on any WebEx links right now. Um, the conference call, and you see here the 1866 number, which is the WebEx conferencing number. Um, so you'll, if uh, a student wants to join over the, the teleconference, they're going to dial that 1866 number, and then they're going to dial this nine-digit number that's after that. And this nine-digit number represents this specific class. And basically, you dial that 1866 number, and then you're prompted by a voice recording to put in your, your conference ID number, I believe is what they refer to it as. And that's basically that nine-digit specific number which gets you into your class. And so that's what this is. That nine so you have, they can always come here to this page to get that teleconference information in case they need it. But sometimes students uh, don't have a computer, but they have a phone, and they'll join just over teleconference. And, and, that's and that happens totally sometimes. Live. Yeah, and the phone, yeah, the phone, yes. WebEx got some delay, right? No, WebEx has no delay. Windows Media Video typically has about a 20 second delay, but uh, that's just that Windows Media live stream. WebEx is totally real time. So if you do it uh, through the computer and don't even touch a phone, they, they are uh -huh, you know, pretty much synchronous. Yes. Sometimes it gets scratchy. And, I mean, I'm not saying in your class, yeah. but when I do conferences, when people do through the computer, I don't know, yeah. it's not as good as the phone. Usually, yes. I think that's actually a pretty good assertion that usually, as a general rule, teleconferencing usually has better quality than using a headset. Right. And I would say that's just technology. You know, yeah. phone's been around a long time. It's been around longer than a computer headset. But, and I, I would say with, with time, it'll catch up. But well, yes, our phones are sometimes they're not the same. They're also probably. <laughs> yeah, and then there's sometimes you're using phones and it's the same phones. thing because it's a VoIP. Yeah, it's a VoIP phone. Yeah, so. Yeah. Sometimes it's the same thing. But um, Our phones are computer. Yeah. Connect your computer to your phone. the next thing I uh, look at here is this control room phone number. And what this is, is this is a specific phone number that goes into the control room where the VPS is producing the class when it's live. So if a student has uh, technical difficulties, or even if you're a professor and you're in distance and you're having some technical difficulties trying to get logged into WebEx or something, you can call this phone number that's on the live page for your class and that will get the VPS that's in the control room that's producing the class as it's happening as opposed to getting somebody else that doesn't know what's happening to the class at the time and so it's a lot more helpful because if there's actually a problem happening with the class they'll actually know about it whereas somebody that's sitting in an office won't necessarily know what's going on so it's a lot more helpful so we do that so that phone number is specific to this class is classroom basically that control room and then here it says collaborative learning software. And these are just two quick links to Blackboard and WebEx. Um, let's go ahead and back up to the home page. Go back down here to the quick links. Um, just a shortcut to WebEx. 
Um, it does say in parentheses something about a default password. Basically what, that's, uh, what we usually do is when we set up the WebEx sessions in pre-semester for our classes, we usually set them up with just kind of a default password. And then if, uh, so, um, if a professor doesn't want that default password because that's obviously somebody could just log in that's not in your class and, and view it for a little bit to decide whether they want to take the class or whatever. But if a professor decides they don't want that, they just want their students looking at it, their WebEx session, they could actually create their own password and post it in Blackboard. And then that way, um, only their students have access to the password. But when we start out, we usually just put a default password and then the professor can change it to whatever they want if they want to do that. Um, uh, the next link here is uh, Watch Archive Classes, which is just going to, just kind of a shortcut way to get you to the, if you're just coming to the website just to get to the archives. So that'll give you links to the WebEx site that has, uh, the page on the WebEx site that has the WebEx recordings and the page that has the Windows Media Video recordings. Um, the Download Archive Classes, we're going to go ahead and look at that. It says permission required in parentheses underneath it. And we're going to talk about that just a little bit. You see here at the top of the page, there's a bunch of text here. And basically what this is saying is that, um, and, and before I say this, let me explain that this is, the downloads here is in reference to the Windows Media videos that we create and archive. Um, we do not make the Windows Media video recordings downloadable by default because they're a lot easy easier to just take and pirate and re-upload and whatever, you know, which is very popular right now, stealing other people's videos. But um, uh, so we don't do that by default. We make it permission uh, of, that is granted by the professor. And, um, and so what, what this explains is that if you're a student and you want to be able to download those videos, you're going to have to email your professor and ask for permission first. And then uh, if they get permission to do it, then they forward the, that email thread to us, and then we will email them with a username and password to be able to do that. Um, and then they will just come to this page, and they can scroll down, and they can click on their class, and then they'll enter the username and password that we gave them, and then they can get in and download those videos. But that's, that's something that we do um, so that uh, the content isn't just out there. Um, your, your coursework isn't just out there to be taken. So uh, with the WebEx, which we'll get into a little bit later, we usually make those downloadable by default, and I'll explain why when we get to it. But it's uh, one, the main reason is basically because it's a, pretty much a lot harder to steal than the other ones. Uh, it's a lot more secure. So, but we'll get to that in a bit. But you can still always lock it down if you want to. Still always. Professors have options and choices. So even if we do something by default, you can always say, well, we don't. I don't want it that public, and we can always change that. But we'll talk about WebEx in extensively after the question and break. Uh, and then the last link I'm going to look at here on our website is this WebEx Telecon request form. And I'm going to go ahead and click on that link. It's going to pop up a login window. And what that's asking for is my Missouri s and login. So I'm going to go ahead and enter that in. And uh, some professors that do distance courses with us really like to split up uh, their class into teams, into groups, and work on group projects. But if you have a student that's in Australia and, and one in Venezuela and three in America that are in different states, that's basically literally impossible, physically impossible for those people to get together out, out of class time to work on their project together. So we offer this service to them to where if uh, you have, uh, if you split up your class into, into teams, that they can come here and they can fill out this form and we will set up, set up a WebEx session for them and then they can have their own WebEx session with their team outside of class time and work together and collaborate together on their project. And so what they do is they come through here and they fill out their name and their data, the date that they want to uh, do it on and the, and the time and, uh, and, and the class that they're doing it for. And then at the bottom, uh, they can check a box that says recurring weekly and and which means like if they say well every Tuesday from 7 to 8 we want to have uh, a meeting with our team and they can click that and submit and then we can set what happens is we get an email 
with all this information from the form. We set up the WebEx session for them, and then we email them with all the information they need to uh, join the, to start the WebEx session themselves and do it all by themselves, and then they just collaborate together with their partners, and it works out really well. There are some professors, it's not necessary for professors to use this, but there are some professors that like to use this form uh, to set up office hours for their online students where they'll come through here and they'll set up and say, well, every Monday from 4.30 to 5.30, I'm going to be online for my distance students in a WebEx session taking questions. Just like you would have office hours on campus for your on-campus students to come in and, and to talk to you. And so you could set this up as a recurring thing every week and, and have those office hours online with your distance students if you wanted to. As I said, it's not necessary for a professor to use this form because they actually have an account. We create an account uh, under their name and we can give them the login information and they can do it on their own. They can create their own WebEx sessions on their own. But um, some prefer just to fill out the form and send it to us and have, them, have us set it up for them. But, um, and that works out pretty well. And we like using WebEx in this, uh, in this way, especially for the students, because um, when the students are, if they're, if they're working on a group presentation and they have to give that presentation at the end of the semester, if they're collaborating in WebEx and they're practicing in WebEx with their presentation, by the time they go to give their presentation at the end of the semester, they, already, they know WebEx inside and out because they've been using it the whole semester. So it's not like they've practiced it and then they go to do it and then they have to use something they've never used before. So it makes it really easy and to be able to present in WebEx, it, which is pretty easy as we'll see in a minute that, to do anyway, but they learn it inside and out of how they want to present in WebEx and how they want to do it. And it really sets them up pretty good. And the other reason why we like being able to do this for our students, especially our on-campus students too, is because WebEx is used a lot out in the business world. And there's actually a lot of our students, uh, distance students, are already using WebEx at their work. And so they know WebEx already. And then there's, uh, for our on-campus students, it's kind of nice because they get to learn WebEx. So it's kind of a little educational experience as well. They get to learn WebEx before they graduate and go out and use WebEx in the workplace. So it's got kind of some really good uh, positives that they get to use it this way on their own. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there and open up the floor for questions and a break and let me see we've got, you. got about Any. we can have about five ten minutes any question oh I've got ten minutes worth of questions myself because you, yeah. you make me sit here and wait but I don't want to jump in if you no that's fine okay. well. we've actually we could probably go about fifteen minutes even so yeah, we, but I we've have got ten minutes worth of questions <laughs> <laughs> maybe his will cover yours <laughs> well what we don't answer now we will actually have a lot more time to answer after the second round of presenting, too, because we have okay, an hour sorry, after that. Fast. Uh, so. <laughs> how many VCC classrooms do we have on campus? I believe the total is about up to like 12 now, I think. It's about a dozen. 12. Do you have a map of where they're located? Yeah, because actually in the back of the room. We'll yeah, and there's a binder the if you want okay, on the back if you want to pick it up and look at it. I never plan well and always get the worst one that doesn't have HD. <laughs> uh, I had a question about your uh, distance classes. How many are they uh, undergraduate classes? Not very many. Yeah, We're we just most starting to do that. Yeah, we, we have a, whole a few different here, uh, philosophy. Uh, right. I think uh, I think we have uh, MSU coming. So you're so saying there's a price issue one? there, right? A big one. Yeah. yeah. I think we, Ross. How many undergrad? classes do we do? Like maybe a couple? Uh, we just have the one down from St. Louis to Buckles. here in ME and yeah. then of course starting the MSM. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just the, a handful. The thing with uh, Missouri State. Yeah. Yeah, we don't do near as many. As, we don't even have undergrad programs, I don't think, online programs. <coughs> so it's... We're yeah. For this last uh, yeah. thing that you show there, you can do your own WebEx. That's no extra cost. Uh, the department we consider that just part of the class. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, okay. So if With you have a class, it's not going to hit by using this. It's not going to go, it's not going to be an extra charge. If you want to use it outside of class, you can, you can use WebEx outside of your class, but then we charge you. Yeah, but if I want to do, use it in the class this way. No charge, yeah. There's no part charge. of the class. So when you're saying outside, you mean if I want to use it for, for my research purpose. Yeah, right. 
something yeah. other than uh, collaborative with your students. Yeah, it's not part of the course. Okay. And, uh, You're taking the whole ten minutes. Man. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been three. <laughs> The, this issue with the passwords and the downloads, I always had these questions at the beginning of the, or one third into the semester. Um, when you do a, send an email that says, okay, anyone can download it, can the on-campus students also download? Well, we do it per student, so no. You give permission per student that's enrolled in your course to be able to download. So there's no... Uh, Blanket, like, okay, anyone can download the class. You, you can. No, unless, unless you say so. It's up to a professor. Yeah. You can I, give them the password and stuff mm -hmm. to the downloads, but, you, but we're only giving the password out to the students that contact mm -hmm. us. And co conversely, the actual archive video, that has no password unless we actually request to be off, right? Yeah, the, the archives. There is, a, there is a means of making it more secure through Blackboard. She'll but, discuss that later. But um, yeah. no, there's no password. It's posted to our website, and you just stream it. The ones it's that we looked at on our website, yeah, there's no login or anything. But when she gets to Blackboard, she'll show a way where you can actually put it all in Blackboard. And so the only way you would get to it yeah, that's new. would be, be from black that. through their Blackboard. Okay. But Which all, is obviously a lot all more this time, all private. the classes that are archived, they're always available for anyone in the public, right? Depends on the professor. Oh, so we can actually, you have to request to take them off? If a professor says, I like to have my stuff secure, I don't want everybody to see it, we, can, we, we have methods of, of hiding them. Not every, not every class is on that live page. Well, I'm, I'm trying to so. prepare for undergraduate here. Okay. Because if we have undergraduates, they will not come to class. Right. And they are not mature to go and listen to the videos. Or right. So if it's always there, yeah. undergraduate is coming. It's like two semesters we for us. We it to where only your distance students can get access to those. Or, even, uh, your, even your on-campus students couldn't see And I'll talk about that them. during my Blackboard okay. yeah. And do we have capacity for, uh, I guess, question more for Ross, to handle how many undergraduate classes? Well, in because I know that uh, whenever I ask Dulce for a class, she's like, oh, we can barely fit it, you know. Are you talking about the number of classrooms we have right. and time of day yeah. to do it? Right. Do we have a... It's, we're, pretty, we're pretty full. I mean, in ter so I guess we're just talking about we're, we're relatively full. Uh, as we're probably running about 75% full. And, and the reason for that is... The times that aren't full are the ones that people don't want, you know, Friday afternoons, early in the morning. And we have times of day that are totally booked, and we have other right. times that are open. And they're usually not at convenient times. Right. So we do have excess capacity. It's just the times people the, don't the want. Time, the favorite times are all taken. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm done. So i got a, a couple of quick ones. Um, since this is all being recorded, what are the copyright issues? Do we need to worry about anything when we're throwing text? Because I realize, obviously, use is allowable for academics, but now you're recording and dis disseminating as well. So what are the copyright issues? That's always kind of an ongoing debate, I think. But uh, yeah, let, let me, Henry probably have a better let me make answer. A comment here. This whole thing right now is sort of in a can of worms. and. Uh, Congress has authorized the TEACH Act, you may be familiar with it, which gives faculty a lot of flexibility in what they want to do. In your classroom, right? Yes, yeah, in the classroom. Now, this, this thing is, uh, has tentacles reaching out into distance education. And uh, the rule of thumb, <laughs> and uh, this is Weeby's rule of thumb, is that if it's password protected, and I'm not dictating what level that password protection has to be, then it's okay to operate under the auspices of the TEACH Act. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we got notified by a Higher Learning Commission that we have to go in and reaccredit all distance education courses and programs that we have, even though we just got inspected last year. They're doing this for everybody all over the country. Uh, and. Uh, one of the questions that has to be addressed in there is what do we do to protect copyrighted material? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm pushing that, and this, this is happening all over the country, what I'm going to do is push that up to legal in Columbia. 
and uh, I've done this before, and that's how Weeby's rule got developed. <laughs> no problem. I, but, appreciate, I appreciate the candor of the answer. Yeah. That we just it, don't know yet. And, we, we don't know yet. Okay. And, uh, but there will be some guidance that uh, we'll be formulating. Okay. Can we, now, uh, live streaming, that, uh, that should be okay, right? Because that's in the classroom, essentially. Well, it, but if you see, make it depends it, on if you how we it, that right, be a the problem. archive. Of the, right. Yeah. Now, it, so, it may be as simple as having to log on with your university ID and password. Uh, it may be that we need to provide additional password protection. I, I just don't know yet. So but if until it turns we out know, that you have to remove it somehow, VCC can probably block out those copyrighted items, right? It takes a lot of extra work. Well, it, it does because uh, some faculty get permission to use those and see if permission right. is granted, that then it doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. If you don't use copyrighted material, and there's a lot of flexibility on what you can use. Under the TEACH Act, you can use copyrighted material without ever getting permission. And that's part of the stuff we've got to sort out. And I'm going to do it as quickly as I can Okay. so we don't get burned. <laughs> um, I guess, can we invite other lectures in, Absolutely. and and we're not just into this room, but via distance. So that's okay. So in other words, if I want to have a guest lecture and I want to and I want to be here and introduce them, and then they're going to call in from Timbuktu and participate. So that's not a problem. We yeah. can get access to. We've done that. Okay. Um, can this be coupled with other technologies like PRS, the personal response systems, or other things? Are these classrooms multifunction enabled so that we can actually use multiple pedagogical approaches? We. Uh, I believe that the PRS, that's like, like with clickers. using the clickers. Yeah. Uh, we have done that, yes, in some of our classes. Uh, we don't actually own any of that, but ed, I believe EdTech does, and we collaborate with EdTech to use those PRS systems. We've done it in here for an ERP class, actually, in this room. Okay. Um, and then these last two, you may or may not know the answer, but I'm looking for documentation where you can point to me in the educational peer reviewed literature. Two, th two questions I have. One, what are the pedagogical innovations that are documented to be used with this technology? And two, why video is better over just audio? Why don't I just podcast these? So I'm, I'm looking if you can you know, point to me. You don't have it in here, but as an academic, when you say, well, it gives it a more classroom feel, I say, great, who measured that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So what I'd, like to, what I'd like to know, you may not know them offhand, but this will, this will have a whole lot more academic rigorous feel to me if I saw the documentation of why video is better. What's the, what's the advantage of video over just audio over live and then what is the, you know, what are the pedagogical innovations that have been incorporated into this so that I can then say, well, so what are the case studies and best practices and actually know how to use it besides stumbling through it all on my, all my own. Yeah. I can comment on that one again too. Those studies are hard to find, they're just underway. The uh, Department of Education has uh, released a meta-study where they took about 1,400 different studies, condensed them down to about, uh, I think around, I can't remember, whether it was 100 or 200, and drew some conclusions out of that. Okay. One of the conclusions they drew that's widely cited now is that uh, online education is a little better than face-to-face -face education. And people are quoting that. Well, if you go down to the next paragraph, they state, don't draw too many strong conclusions from this. So even at that level, the uh, studies are pretty weak. Uh, we've been conducting one in cooperation with the medical school at uh, Kansas University to address the very question you're asking, uh, whether the uh, video and the image of the faculty member in there makes a difference to the uh, students and uh, we get engaged the engineering students at KU to run this test and the reason we went there is because of, there's a physician that's also a communication expert that, that we could work with. The very preliminary conclusions in there uh, based on uh, physiological responses indicate that the image of the professor enhances the, well, we know it enhances the response of the student physiologically. What we don't know is if that translates into learning. Okay? So we're at that stage. And it's in a very pioneering area all over the country trying to figure this out. We did a, a pretty good survey last <coughs> yeah. spring semester of all our distance student, students, pretty rigorous survey, asking them, you know, how important is video in your classes that you've been taking here? And, and the pretty much overwhelming response is they, 
they preferred the video. There were some said, I don't need it. Some said, it makes no difference. Since. Some said, I really like it. But generally, the ones who said, I really like it, even on their own without being promptly spelled out why they really like it. So I think it a lot depends on what kind of a learner you are, how important the video is. We got the same response out of KU. Okay. And the question in both cases that has not been answered is the preference for that. Does it translate into better learning? Sure. So I guess, I, I guess in my mind, I'm thinking if, you know, if you're going after like a STEM education grant and if you add a distance component, you have a broader impact. Well, we like can some kind of grant. Yeah, we can say that they like it better. Be nice to know what kinds of studies you already have here, what kinds of resources we could leverage. So, okay. so who's, uh, I can who's give the guru you on campus that writes the papers in education? Is there a guru? Like, uh, I, I, there was a guy in IT that was professor that was hired to do that kind of stuff. Boy, I don't know. Cernuka or Cernuka? Cernuka. Yeah, Cernuka. Dan Cernuska. Oh, Dan, Dan, Dan Cernuska. Yes. Yeah. Yes, he, he's the one that's conducting that study at uh, Kansas University. Okay. I can put you in touch with him if you want. Yeah. Okay, today I'm going to talk to you about the use of Blackboard in conjunction with producing your course through the Video Communication Center. Um, I've got to be upfront, the VCC is not in control of the Missouri S&T Blackboard website. EdTech Educational Technology, which is an office under IT, they are in charge of it. So. We're not experts in Blackboard. We do try to attend the training sessions. We do try to keep up with what's going on. However, if you come to us with a question, we might answer it. And if we can't, we're going to point you in the right direction. So we're definitely here to help. And we will get you in contact with the correct person that will help you. Right now, Blackboard has been upgraded to version 9. If you have not attended a training session for version 9, I recommend that you do. Uh, EdTech's holding training sessions tomorrow and Friday. So for you guys who have already taught distance, you might want to check that out if you haven't already. Um, and my presentation is just a brief overview of the use of it. Their presentation is going to last about an hour, and they'll get more in depth with the tools and the features that you can use and the things that have really changed. But um, oh, on this slide, I'm just going to give you an idea. Can I ask a question? Yes. Take a break from asking questions at the end. Yeah. Did VCC record the latest training session on Blackboard Online so we can see that on? No. Because I know that they have a whole bunch of little clips for Documentum. Yeah, and they've video. got tutorials on their website. Videos? But mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if they're videos. I can't Thanks. answer Sorry that. I apologize. So, but no, we did not record it. Because we want to fast forward too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of tutorials on YouTube right now, though. For what? And For I'm nine. going to provide some links at the end mm -hmm. of this presentation. And this presentation will be posted to our website so you can have access to those links afterwards. Um, here, it's just a outline of what I'll be discussing. We've got examples of how Blackboard can help you, uh, VCC services involving Blackboard, and then just important things to remember with your distance class. Uh, this example was pulled from a summer course that used Blackboard 9. One of the biggest changes here that you may notice is that you don't necessarily have to go to the control panel for editing tools. You can click on whichever tab. This particular example has content clicked. And then you have these control tools right here. And you can edit within the page now. Uh, I'm going to point out the uh, importance or usefulness of posting your presentations and other material within Blackboard. So your distance students and on-campus students can access this material. In this example, we have the syllabus. Um, that's useful because the students can go back throughout the semester and review it. We've also got some presentations presentations and other material here. Um, depending on your teaching style, you may want to post your presentation before class. The student can print that out, bring it to class, write notes on it while you lecture, or while you uh, add lecture notes on the Wacom tab. Or you can uh, save your notes and post it afterward. You can do both. It's whatever you want to do. And depending on what your presentation style is, if you prefer to write your notes out, you can do that as Michelle explained earlier with the OneNote um, software or you can use PowerPoint. It just all depends on what you like. 
Okay, I'm going to delve into this a little bit. With the version 9 upgrade, there's no longer a digital Dropbox. However, if you use the Create an Assignment tool, which is actually found under Evaluate, in this example it's under Assignments, it will create an automatic entry in your grade center. Now, with digital Dropbox, you had to go through and sort it out from your students where they had submitted their homework, test, quiz, etc. Now it's just going to make a column within the grade center for where that um, assignment was made and then you just go in the grade center and you can grade it right there. It's sorting it for you so it's a little more convenient. And in this example I have test one. That's what the teacher preferred to call it. So let's go into the grade center. The grade center is found under the control panel, evaluation, grade center. This will appear. It'll be different for however you want to set it up. You can alter it to your specifications. Here is test one. Um, if you haven't graded it yet and the student has submitted it, it'll appear as a green box with a white exclamation point rather than a grade. Obviously this professor has graded his stuff. But over here we have our last name of the students. We've got their first name and then their username from Missouri s and email. Um, something I'd like to point out is that you can actually send an email right here. You just click by their name, hit email, write your message and send it. So that's useful if you graded an assignment and you think, wow, this student's really off task and I need to communicate with them right away. You don't have to use a second party. You can do it all right here. We've got their last. Is this, this linked to minor mail? Do you get an archive yeah. that you sent out a mail? Mm -hmm. oh, great. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. So um, I'm going to move on. We've got their last access date. Let's say you've got some students here. I've grayed out their names, by the way, for privacy's sake, because we've got some of them who just aren't doing so hot in this class, and I figured they wouldn't want that broadcast live. But um, you got their last access, so if you're curious to see if they're keeping up with their work, you're concerned, you know, some distance students might put things off, you know, you can go in there and see how hard they're really trying. You can keep up with their efforts. Um, and then here we've got another assignment that this professor created. I, I'm assuming that he did this within class and then added the column afterward because he didn't have it under his assignments in the assignment tab. But as you can see, 5 plus 76 equals 81, so you got your total. This professor didn't use the weighted total column, um, but if you do, it'll just show up as a percentage for the full semester. These columns are, as I said, they can be customized and you can actually hide them if you're not using them. You just click here and then it gives you different options. So uh, I think that covers that within here. Next I want to move on to commonly used communication tools. These are commonly used tools for a VCC course or a class that you're producing through the VCC. You might find these other tools handy for other reasons though. But a big difference with version 9 upgrade is that you're not going to find your send an email option under communication. You're going to find it right under tools. When you click on this, all of these are going to appear. And the send an email is something I've seen used pretty commonly. Uh, professors might inform their students that test one's been posted, um, something along the lines of that. We use this as a VPS if we have any kind of technical, technical problem during your class. It serves as kind of a listserv for their uh, Missouri s and email, the minor mail. And you can click on which section you want to send an email to, and it's just like a blast email to all those students at one time. Um, and if we have a technical difficulty, we'll use that to inform the students that there might have been something that occurred, and then you'll be included in that as well, so you're informed too. Uh, the discussion board. Nathan dis mentioned how to save the chat and then you can put it in the discussion board, the chat from WebEx that is. And the students can use this to go back and reference what went on during class. Um, I've seen this used extensively in a particular course where there's a lot of on-campus students and a lot of off-campus students. And the on-campus students sometimes will bring their laptop to class, log into WebEx themselves, and then chat back and forth. Well, we can save that and then just post it in here. They could go in there and, and write about it and discuss it later on. I've seen professors use this, let's say for example, they've got an article that they feel pertains to the material in their class, but they're concerned about time. They might post the article on Blackboard and then have their students read it and then they can talk about it through here and the professor can go through and review it so it doesn't tie up class time. 
Um, and then this isn't, I don't know if this is real commonly used myself, but I just saw messages and I saw email and I thought, well, what's messages? It's actually a form of communication within Blackboard itself. You are given an inbox in Blackboard, and if you use this, your students will receive a message within Blackboard. If you choose to use this option, inform your students to keep abreast of what's going on in their inbox, because otherwise they might not realize that they even have that. All right, VCC services involving Blackboard we can secure the video archives. This is something we kind of discussed. I'm going to show you how it's done. Um, in this example, it's posted under content, but these tabs can be customized as well. We could just make a link con uh, tab for you rather than post it under content itself. And what we'll do is we'll go under build, build an external link, and then here down at the bottom is the link for the WebEx archives. Uh, recently, we figured out a way of doing it for the Windows Media Archives as well. So then your enrolled uh, students can get in here, click on this, and they'll get access to your video archives that way so it's not just posted to the website. Conversion of video. This is particularly important. We want you guys to bring any kind of videos that you want to play during your class to us first. We recommend that you get the copyright. Uh, permission granted before so. And if it's a VHS tape, um, some of our rooms are not equipped with VHS players. There is one in particular that I know of that still has that, but we really would rather you bring it to us first. And what we'll do is we'll convert it over to a digital file and we'll place it on a server. Now if you've already got a di digital file like a Windows Media file or something along the lines of that, we'll take that and place it on the server. And Whenever we do that, we'll create a link, and we can send you the link via email, or we'll post it in your Blackboard. And we'll hold on to those uh, files in the server for coming semesters if you plan on teaching with us in the future. So it isn't a process you're going to have to go through over and over every semester. You'll just get in contact with us and say, I want to show that video this semester. Could you make sure it's available for me? And then we'll do that. Okay, I'm going to get into the combining sections and making sections available portion. This gets a little convoluted, so please bear with me. It's really important that you remember to make your sections available before the semester starts, otherwise your students might log in and think they're not enrolled in your class because it may not appear. <laughs> um, in this example, I have uh, Engineering Management 308, and I'm going to discuss how to combine or the purpose of combining, I should say. And we've got LEC 1A, which is actually your, your on-campus students. LEC 1DIS is your distance students throughout the world. They could be anywhere. And then LEC 1SX is actually an abbreviation for students who are located in St. Louis. Now, there could be stu um, this third section sometimes could be abbreviated differently for students in Fort Leonard Wood or students in Saudi Arabia, just whatever. So we've got these three sections and this professor chose to combine all three into the LEC 1A. And what that means is basically she's taking the names from these two sections and putting it in here so that all of the material will be available just in this first section. So she can post her homework and all the students have access to it. And she's made that section available. Now, um, if you want only your distance students to have access to your secure archives, <laughs> you're going to go ahead and combine all three so that they can get their homework, their articles to read, whatever, whatever material you want them to have. But for the archiving purpose of the videos, we're only going to combine the two distance sections. So you would take the students from here, put them into the LEC1 distance here, and then after that, we'll put the external link I spoke about earlier into that section, and you would make it available. So when the student logs in, they'll have two sections that they can click on, but only one will provide them with the video archives. And then the on-campus on students will only have the on-campus section available to them, if that makes sense. It's really, it's a little confusing to try and explain. So here I've provided a link for how to combine 
you just go through this and it takes you step by step. If you have any trouble, here's a link for IT to re you know, request help. And then here I've included the directions on how to make your section available. You go under control panel and then you just go down to customization and properties and then you click on number three which is make available and you hit yes. All right, this is the link for EdTech. There's the tutorials for Blackboard 9. I've also <coughs> included a link to YouTube here. There's a lot of material there that you can look up on particular subjects. That's how I researched quite a bit of it through both of these. And last but not least, with the Video Communication Center, you will never fly solo. You've always got a VPS in the control room ready to help. We have pretty extensive office hours, as you can see, Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., and then Friday, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Unfortunately, we do not have weekend hours, but I kind of like that. <laughs> I like my weekends. <laughs> but um, at any rate, we're just here to make this as easy and an enjoyable as experience as possible. And for further information and details, you can visit our website. And as I said, this presentation along with the video will be posted there. Um, next week is test week. So if you're new to distance education and you've got a class in one of the classrooms, go ahead and make an appointment with us. You can contact us through either the VCC help at mst.edu or the 4526 number. And we'll set you up and we'll let you come into the classroom and you can kind of get used to the software and the computer and just the surroundings in general. Um, it's really important for distance professors to test with us as well to make sure that their computer is going to work with the WebEx and that we've got all the kinks worked out before the actual week of classes. So, oh, yeah, I should mention the fact that we are on Facebook. We have a fan page. Um, there are tutorials on there about WebEx and other material. There's also FAQs available. And then we have a YouTube channel where you can also access some of the tutorial material. So, and I'm going to open up for discussion. When I need to make the appointment, you just said, uh, I'm planning to have a DCC class. Okay. So yeah. I need to make an appointment. Could we do that Yeah, now? yeah, just you send us an email or okay. give us a call and we'll can set we you up. Can schedule now? Not now. Um, yeah, let me get a pen. It just makes it easier so that first week you're kind of acclimated right, to what yeah. you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, okay. My um, name is Shrestha, S-H-R-E-S-T-H-A, E-J, at Allotical and Computer Engineering. Okay. Uh, what are you going? What we'll do one year, you get one year break. is we'll get in contact with you. Okay. And then we'll give you like an option of different times probably. Okay. So and then we'll, are you going to be at EECH 239 you think? Uh, possibly. Yeah. I would guess since yeah, you're located I, I think there. so. That's, that's where yeah. most of the classes are. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll just uh, <coughs> let you come into the room and okay. we can work okay. on that. Fantastic. Yeah. Quality. Yes. Hey, I've got uh, four questions here. Okay. Uh, First, why so many synchronized monitors in the room? That is, um, well, my second question is going to follow from your answer. So, Well, for the students who are sitting in this first row, they have an easier time reading these monitors, and whereas the students who sit towards the back have a better time reading those. Okay. So it's just... It, I kind of thought that would be the answer. I knew about the side monitors for the, yeah, for that's, the presenter. Um, yeah. But the next question is, can the monitors be desynchronized somewhat? Yeah. Because uh, here's an issue that I run into when I teach even a non-distance course, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but leading into hybridized courses and distance courses. Um, students don't like me using the computer at the front of the classroom for a math class because it, they don't get the blackboard kind of experience. That is, with a, with a multi-panel blackboard in the classroom with chalk, I can start in the top left corner of uh, the multi-panel with the solution of a problem and go through all the details. And when I get to the end, if they have a question about the beginning, we don't have to scroll back and find what it is they're looking for. They just point and say, that's the one I want. 
Yeah. So if I could do that with this, I could have the first page of what I'm talking about on the left monitor and the second page on the right monitor and have it scroll through as I'm going, that would be much better than having it all on one monitor, well, than having only one page on all the monitors at the same time. Right. And the same for the distance students. If they could see uh, two panels in their computer with one of them with the first page and the sec another one with the second page, um, that, that would be so much better for, for long solutions of math problems mm -hmm. and engineering problems as well, I bet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, equations. The best thing I could think of on that is um, if you wanted to have different inputs, as it were, on different monitors. That's right. But you're writing kind of on, I mean, obviously, we only The have different one inputs computer, are from the same, basically so, from the same input, but time, time delayed. Um, is I would say the best thing that I could think of off the top of my head would be that you could plug your laptop in and work on two computers, start on one on the laptop and then work your way over to the to the podium computer or vice versa. And then you would have some of them yeah. would have the laptop and some of them would have the, the podium <coughs> computer. And so that would have two right. different inputs. Yeah. Which would that, make it a little longer. That, that uh, to some extent addresses the issue, but now you don't have the whole set of notes available to save right. at the end because they're in different documents right. on different machines. You could put them together if you were doing it. You'd have to now, do that separately later. Together. Yeah, later. But you'd have to zip them together because they'd be even pages here and odd pages there. I, I think we could possibly. Do a, a kind of like a screen capture of the first part of your equation. That'd be fantastic. And just put it on the left screen. Is that what you're exactly saying? what I was thinking of? And pause that there, and then have your what your second part of the or just equation time on. delay. Could do that. Just do a screen capture. The, you, the, each page. the hard part with that would be coordinating with us in the back. So I mean, it wouldn't be hard, but you could say, okay, can you can right. you put put up what I've just done? And, and yeah, or there could be an audio cue. Like, uh, I'm going to solve a long problem now, and then the, the <laughs> VPS knows that means to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it would, I think it would be possible. Yeah. Okay. That's a question that would be best posed to our technical yeah. personnel. It would, it would also be something that would be, if you came in, and we could practice with you and see if that's That'd be great. Would I can do that this semester because I'm not teaching any classes. But it does, right? It does move. Follow the talker. Well, that's we the that. Yeah, we moved that. <laughs> yeah, I thought that when you, when you touch right this, there are some, this, automatically come. There are First some video classrooms in other campuses that can do that. Uh, Polycom systems do that. They'll respond. We have these set up to manual, though. See, right. now they have they have desynchronized them to some extent. The back ones now don't show the same thing that's in the front. Mm -hmm. the, it's set up so each, all these four large monitors can each display something different all at the same time if we wish to. That's what I prefer. Control back yeah. there. But what you're asking for is something that they are not currently set up to do, so we'd have to talk to Roy to see about making that happen. Because they take their different inputs from different things, like that camera, that yep. camera, that camera, the polycom, the computer. Right. Right. But you want four different outputs from one input, and we'd have to do Actually, for me, for two would about. be enough. Two. I think okay. two would be enough. So screen what, capture sounds like Screen so capture is the way to go. We're, we're and have to screen capture with, screen with a delay, time delay. Uh, we could screen display. In the, yeah. We could screen, do a print screen in the, in the control room because mm -hmm. uh, we'll be in WebEx in there. We can print screen it when right. you want us to and then, right. and then we would just freeze frame it and mm -hmm. put it on a different input in here and then right. we just keep rolling forward. So that yeah. probably would be... Four would certainly be better but two is, uh, is fantastic at this time. You know, another totally different approach would be to uh, get a hold of Dan Chernuska and see from a pedagogical standpoint how it's best to present long problems. He's a PhD mechanical engineer, so he's very familiar with those. Yes. And it's best uh, to have them done ahead of time. However, sometimes a student yeah. asks a question in class and you do a problem on the fly and it turns out to be one that takes a couple of right. panels of the blackboard and uh, some other student says, well, how about line two on the first blackboard? Yeah. Well, it's not available if you're doing it uh, the way that 
this is done. Well, and with everything synchronized. Yeah, and with OneNote, OneNote does have a lot of cool features about that, in the sense that um, when you're drawing on OneNote, as you go to the bottom of the page, it'll actually extend. Yes. You can keep going down farther, which is nice. And like what you were saying, and doing things in advance, which we didn't talk about, since all I think probably every PC on campus has Microsoft Office, which has OneNote, which means you can actually build some of those stuff up front. Ahead of time. Ahead of time. And then you would just save that OneNote to your thumb drive or whatever and come to class and plug it in and open it from here and go from there. And we've actually, I've actually had some professors do that. Well, I use... Pre-prepared stuff in OneNote right. and bring it here. I use journal save notes. it back to their thumb drive. I use Journal Note, which is very similar, but uh, yeah. but not with what I guess OneNote considers the bells and whistles. But the the thing is, even with that, when I've done it ahead of time, if it only shows one panel at a time, students are asking me to scroll back five pages frequently. It takes time in the classroom, and then at the end of the semester, that's the main complaint. I'd rather you use the blackboard because I can't see what you did earlier in the lecture whenever we're working on something you did later. And so that's, the, that's one of the biggest complaints I have. And that's not even in distance cl classes. That's classes with a computer at the front of the classroom. The next thing, uh, sorry, this is the third you need one. a second screen. You need a second that. screen, I'm, absolutely. I'm, I'm, Governor, I'm planning to do that with, because uh, I get one of my classes fitted with a second projector. Yeah. I plan. I do. I do have to do that because I'll typically start a problem. I'll move it over to the other monitor and then work it on the second one. That's right. That's right. That's what you want. Need two screens at least. Um, the yeah. uh, the third one is partially answered. Can a faculty teaching a non VCC course use collaborative web WebEx form uh, for office hours or something like that? I thought that whenever I taught a VCC class before. They told me something like I could use the VC, the WebEx, uh, for uh, one-time conferencing or something like that. But the discussion here a little bit ago indicated that I'd be charged for that, and I never heard of that before. The discussion was if you're doing it as a conferencing outside of the, you know, for that course. Like if you um, decide that you're going to have a conference with some other professors about a subject, but it, it's not the course that you're dealing with your students. It's something completely different. But what, if, what about the class like, uh, for right now, um, when I teach linear algebra, it's not a VCC class. It's not a distance course. The, the problem is the VC, what the distance students are charged pays for WebEx. Okay. So that's what I wanted to know. Because yeah. I had misunderstood it before. That's why I wanted to ask the question. Now, the, the, the fourth question, which I numbered five on here for some reason, uh, who teaches the students how to use the technology? Because in the class, I don't have time to do that. And that's another of the complaints that I've had about classes, uh, both distance and non-distance, not from the distance students' perspective, but students on campus who've not let, yet learned how to use Blackboard or WebEx or um, whatever other technology I use in the classroom like MathCAD, Maple, Mathematica, et cetera. In class, I don't have time to lecture on all that stuff. We teach them everything on our end. You know, okay. what, all that stuff, WebEx, all the distance things, we, and then we do our very best uh, when they have questions about Blackboard to answer them. And if yeah. we can't, we direct them to EdTech who admins that. Okay. And when it comes to uh, programs like uh, MATLAB and, and all those different uh, okay. pro professor programs, what, we are not intelligent enough <laughs> in that area <laughs> to, to teach those things. I don't things. know if that would be in IT. But, um, if they would need to be well, directed the, to IT. This all goes to, to a question that Ronaldo brought up earlier, and that is, how are we going to do this for undergraduate classes? The graduate classes, well, you say, go learn how to do the technology. And the, and if the graduate student doesn't do it, you say, well, drop the course. But an undergraduate, you, don't, you can't tell them that. You don't have time to, to spend answering all the complaints they're going to have about 
I don't know how do to, I don't know which have, button to click in that software. Do you currently have in the, you know, first day of classes, one week before and one week after, some like VCC office hours? We do test week. Test we, week? Yeah, that's what. And then you contact the students that are enrolled and you tell them, come here and learn. Um, on next week, Currently, the week before the semester. We do that with distance week. students. Yeah, that's what I mean. That, that's yes. what we're talking about here. Yes. And any distance student that actually shows up to test week, we, we have people monitoring the WebEx that's up. And as soon as someone pops up, we get on and we try to talk to them. Sometimes they don't answer us back whatsoever. And when they do, one of the first questions out of our mouths is, have you used WebEx before? And if they are familiar with WebEx, that's fine. If not, we take them on a so tour on how to use it. They get this type of open house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. The, the thing is, with with hybridized classes or completely on campus classes, how are we going to do this? Yeah. That's a how are we going to get them to understand yeah, that's how to a, use this stuff? That, that's a question that is pervasive across the country. This technology Absolutely. develops. Absolutely. And right now. It's uh, pretty much thrown into the professor's lab to, if you have specialized software like MATLAB or something else, to either make sure that they have it as a prerequisite or you have some session that, that you teach it. The business school or the business department here, the reason Barry left is they have a, it's either a one week or two week orientation prior to students starting their program. They handle things at, at a department level to do that. We can handle them here on our end with the technology that uh, we uh, use. And you are smart enough to do it, but I don't think you have time to do it in everything. <laughs> the time is the issue. I, yeah. I, I, I'm quite sure you could, you could figure out how to, we figured how out to explain things, some of the MathCAD right. and Maple and so forth to them. We're not asking you to teach them the mathematics yeah. that's in there. It's just which buttons to click to get this yeah. done and, yeah. and so forth. An alternative to that could be if you had um, if you had a grad student that was a TA. Sure. That yeah. Could possibly work out really well actually. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, probably, only large. A lot more. Only large classes, uh, which are currently ne neither distance nor technology intensive, have TAs in our department. So. But, I mean, Calculus. It also, it also for sounds example. like it's a potentially like a development opportunity. Again, maybe something that would be funded, uh, but. We, I mean, we expect students to know how to take and study from notes, and we expect that they've learned that in high school, that somebody, that their high school teacher has written on a blackboard and the students have learned how to take notes, right? So somewhere around sixth, seventh, eighth grade, students start to learn how to copy notes off of the blackboard. Well, I don't know, sure. Maybe, this, maybe they don't do that well. age, I think. Yeah. They're supposed so to learn. Up, <laughs> right. But they so, don't need to write a thing because they got a, this version. So I guess, I guess my question is coming from what, what has been, and I don't know if folks in the room know, but what has been our outreach as a you know, state leader in science and tech education to help you know, our high schools or our junior highs actually not necessarily use all this technology, but just as they would be not just teaching English and math, but also teaching the how to take notes as, as part of their curriculum that they're doing, that, that we're teaching them the, how to have students aware of these kinds of technologies. That for us is, I mean, your, your question was essentially, who teaches students how to take notes? It's just that that's in the 21st, it. in the 21st how century, it's that's who right. teaches students how to use Blackboard? Yeah. And, and you're saying, so that's a, a very 21st century learning question. And right. Well, the thing is, whenever all this technology came in, I began trying to learn it. But for me, the time to take the time to learn it's in the classroom while I'm teaching. But the students don't want me to learn it while I'm while I'm teaching it to them. They want to learn. They want me to tell them or teach them how to learn it, yeah. and they want me to know it all ahead of time. And I don't. I didn't have time to know it all ahead of time before I went into the classroom and used it. I just went in and started using stuff. And you just. Uh, and to to do that, to be learning it and teaching it at the same time, I'm already doing that with math. I can't do it with everything else as well. One thing that we've done, we've mentioned already, is that we have a YouTube channel, and we've put up that's some, great. Yeah. some tutorials about how how the options and features that WebEx has to offer from a distance student's point of view and stuff, and we. And we're not the only ones putting tutorials up on YouTube. YouTube is now just a huge source for tutorials of any kind. It's it's almost it's like the Google of, of videos. So 
you could probably type in it's MATLAB quite tutorial quite and you'll yeah. get a thousand different videos. So, and if there isn't a video, you could even make your own YouTube channel and yeah. try and do some sort of a screen capturing program and do so, some sort of tutorial that you could say your first, first day class if your students are like, I have no idea how to use MATLAB, you can say, go check out my YouTube page. I have a, sh a short five, ten minute video going over the features of, of how to use MATLAB. And we've also then, this summer we created a uh, PDF document that does step by step, what is that, like a 20, 30 page on a document that's uh, for WebEx and it goes through different topics of WebEx, whether it's joining a meeting, hosting a meeting, presenting and things like that, and features. And and it just kind of works really well to have that kind of stuff. And, and that might be part of it too, is just getting that kind of a, and then that one, that's nice because it's just a step by step by step, you know, and it's just kind of a step by step. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll float an idea. So, um, you know, for math placement or English placement, you know, I'm an administrator. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the s &T does, but for across the country, right? Administer a math placement test or administer an English placement test and then yes. figure out where folks go based on their response we have to a skip. Right. So is that, would there be room to administer a, you know, a technology preparation? And if, you, if you're not passing this, then here's where you go to get your remediation. So you That'd be speak, fantastic, right? but it would require some department to... But I mean, I'm not, just, I guess, yeah. right, but I'm floating that as an idea, right? Idea. If we're saying collectively we need students to already know skill X, Y, Z, and yes. we're finding that they come in with all kinds of levels of preparation and that it's not our job to teach them skill X, Y, Z, then how do we actually verify that, they've, that they have the proper preparation to be able to take our kinds of classes? Uh, and if they're not, then, I mean, it, it's not that we have to create a whole new department to do it. The, the stuff may already be there on YouTube. It may already be there. And so it, it may be as simple as kind of the HR training that we, right? I don't, I, I don't know if you haven't gone through the new employee training recently, but we watched three hours of sexual harassment video <laughs> now or something. So, and that, you know, <laughs> I know everything about it, including every case law and all this. And you'll but, be retested every year. Yeah, I'll be retested. But my, my point is, is that that was a very reasonable way to get me to know something and to do a, a test at the end to verify that I've done it. That was a set of skills that you're not going to you know, set necessarily in the classroom and have, and have a whole class on it. So, right. Well, you don't want to practice those. Skills. Yeah, you don't want to practice those. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know if that would be a function that would be uh, within the institution that would make sense if we would collectively say, here's some of the skills that we want to know that they have. Yeah, I would look at it very similar to a math placement or an English placement. I it's agree. A very like first year kind of where they add in their IT skills. I agree. Thank you. I have a question for Ross. I know Ross loves statistics. Keeps track of all these things. I saw that chart there, and uh, that's interesting for the you know class sections. But one thing that I've always wondered is you've always tried to get this great synchronous delivery. And I think it's great that one person that does it in my class, they love it. But that's one person. And the resources that we invest into that one person, I think are pretty substantial to do this synchronous thing as opposed to just say, hey, you know, this is just going to be available, record. And um, it's, it's come across that uh, there's uh, the caliber that we teach, which is high quality, synchronous, asynchronous, got, we got all the bells and whistles, but is there a next level? Because I would say that 96% of my students are not gonna do it at 11 o'clock, and they never done it, they go in knowing that they have a high quality video. Couldn't that be another level of, of uh, quality that is marketed for those classes? Is that percentage that I'm quoting here real? Maybe just for my classes because they're at it in the morning. But uh, how much usage of the synchronous is it getting used? The, <clears throat> the primary use of synchronous is in the evening from 4 to 10 p.m. That's when almost, I mean, the vast majority of students are synchronous. So sure, we're, uh, we're just doing it the same way in the morning because they, we've already got all the equipment 
So if a student can join, it's like it's no more effort to do it synchronously in the morning mm -hmm. than it is later on. So we might as well do them all the same. So which courses are in the afternoon, just for my benefit? What type of course? Most all the Management. systems engineering, uh, most, it's a variety. I'd say, what would you guys say? You, you, you produce some. Engineering and, and mechanical. Systems and mechanical. Mechanical. Do the course evaluations vary? If you take the same instructor and, and offer the class at 11 and offer the class at 8 p.m., do the, do the ways the students look at it? Because if, you know, if it's at 11 a.m., then they can't get on it synchronously. And so I guess I wonder, have you, have you looked at any of those kinds of controls right, where you fine. say... I'm going through that analysis right now. I don't know. Using several years' worth of data. And uh, you do see a lot of variation. It's difficult. I've only looked at it very briefly, but it's difficult for me with that brief look to say what factors influence that. But one of the uh, reasons, we've been, we've been selected, I'll back up a little bit, we've been selected by two major corporations as a preferred provider. <coughs> one of them is Boeing and more recently at Lockheed. And one of the reasons we were selected was because of the availability of the synchronous delivery. Uh, we've come up. You know, how big a factor that is. Mm -hmm. They had many factors in choosing us, but uh, we, we're down to one in four. I mean, we're one of four schools that Lockheed was selected. Uh, for one degree program and one of six that they selected for another degree program. Mm -hmm. And uh, Boeing is selected across the spectrum in degree programs, but uh, they're one of their preferred suppliers also. You so, also had students that, like, whether for Lockheed or some other company, that they were taking the courses during their work hours and they, they were joining synchronous because they could not join asynchronous later nor watch an archive later because they didn't either have computer connection or, didn't, or they were on dial-up and so they couldn't get to the resources. Mm -hmm. So, and now those have been few and far between but we have had them. It's becoming very competitive in our area. Engineering has one of the lowest penetration rates, but uh, it's picking up. I just got a call from Rutgers. They want to jump in. And uh, how, do I, how much advice do I give them? <laughs> all the bad advice that it's, it's, <laughs> it's too hard. hard. Read my papers. <laughs> Read my books. That's right. If we could get rid of Tell them they can't make any money at just <laughs> And I know for us, the way we always think of it is, uh, a lot of online programs are pretty much the same way, which is you log into a Blackboard type format, and there's a course set in there that's like in a PowerPoint format. Maybe there's audio, maybe there isn't, and you just kind of go through it. It's kind of a, you pretty much have to be very self-disciplined sure. to get through it because there's no one teaching you, there's no one pushing you, there's no one, you know, it's just kind of a, I'm going to come in here and do it on my own time. Could have bought the textbook for the hundred bucks instead of the hundreds of dollars for enrollment in the class yeah. and just read the book. And, and the, I know for us, the way we always think about it and, and like it is that we get to serve more than one learning style. Whether there's somebody that can totally do the after the fact stuff and just do it on their own, they can do it that way if they want to, or they can show up to class live and, and do it that way where they've got someone teaching them and, and pushing them, you know, and more of a classroom environment style of teaching and learning. A couple of semesters ago I ran a business course that was in the early afternoon hours to the evening hours. It was kind of a long course. And she wanted to make sure that the students would attend live versus um, watching a video later. And she nobody could tell her how to do that. So what she did was in the middle of the class somewhere she would just say, today's passwords are, it's hot and rolla today. And what they had to do is, whether they attended the class live or watched it, they had to email her before the next court, before the next class, they had to email her that password so that she knew that they did cover the material. Well, they email that before to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I like they that. get around, students just get around faster than you can think of it. But like so she actually wasn't requiring them to be there synchronously. She was just requiring them to verify that they watched the video. Mm -hmm. she was, that's the way that she verified or that, that they, they attended watched it or watched. Because there were other students who would show up and their name would be there. Teams of students get around. But they wouldn't be there. 
they would leave their computer connected and walk away. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, and she was also taking role as to who was, whose name was there. Mm -hmm. This way, she was she was verifying that they, one way or another, saw the material. Sure. You know, the, the University of Illinois yeah, and yeah, the University of Texas system just be issues with that. canceled their programs, their system-wide programs, which were largely asynchronous. And uh, there have been some other... Was that just because of budget cuts, or was that because they actually had data that supported it wasn't working? Or both? Texas may have been a political issue. Okay. I, I'm not completely certain of that. Illinois, I think, was a budget issue that their uh, asynchronous wasn't bringing in, in enough students that stayed with them. Uh, one of the most uh, significant failures early on, uh, several years ago, was Columbia University, who had some very high-profile partners with uh, Stanford uh, and some corporation, Motorola, I think, was in there, and IBM, invested $13 million for a startup, lasted about a year and a half, and they killed it. Oh, they can I, I can't it. understand. Columbia got much it. money in and killing it, but uh, they, uh, in some cases, it, the, a contributing factor almost strikes me as being they tried to do too much too quickly, and it was too big a bite. We've avoided that. Our our growth has been slow, but it's been very steady, even through this recessionary time. And uh, every indication that I've had, uh, it, in some of it's anecdotal says the students like the opportunity to be in a class that's, that's synchronous and they can talk to the professor. We just picked up one from uh, Carnegie Mellon, <laughs> you know, a great school that said for the first time they feel like they're part of a real class when they can be here and they can ask the professor questions. So it's, uh, it's hard to give a peer-reviewed answer. <laughs> To that question. Well, the sample size is small, but I mean, I, I thought Nathan's comment was really good about that. This allows us to offer a variety, yes, variety of learning style, you know, to accommodate a number of learning styles. And I, I wonder, do we market, do we market ourselves that way, and do we measure those things, right? I mean, so, so I mean, that, that's a really intriguing idea. So then, of course, I would say, then what's the data that supports that that idea is actually real? <laughs> But it's a really intriguing idea if we say, well, you know, we're going to already be up there talking on a, a chalkboard anyway. How else can we make this a attached to other kinds of learning styles? So I don't, I don't know. If it's, it sounds like this one fellow might have some relationship with, with cognitive science and understanding an idea of, you know, what, how people want to learn and what are the right kinds of styles. But that would be a, certainly a very interesting area to explore. Yeah, it, it, the data is just getting gathered. This is really a new industry. Hmm. And uh, it's just coming in. It'll certainly level faculty salaries very quickly, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, physics, physics 101 can be taught by anybody across the country. So I want to go to where they get it taught well and cheapest. And well, I teach a lecture of 300 people. You might as well teach a lecture of 3,000 people. And yeah, I, 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 I don't think that'll be the case. Penn State claims that they could teach a class of 400 students just as easily as they can 15. And they made that claim in a conference I attended. I asked them twice during the session, well, how do you know that? And I didn't get an answer, and there's a big group, so I didn't want to press it. But they were very firm on that claim. I'm skeptical. Uh, and what makes me skeptical is the uh, competition that we've had, if you will, I can call it that, I guess, with the University of Southern California, where we have joined with them in a partnership to market systems engineering at Boeing. When we first started, we had about 15 students. They had about 120 to 150 because they're a much higher ranked school. Today we've graduated the same number that they have within two students. And I don't, I can't remember who's ahead. We have never, ever marketed against them. We market jointly. When we go to the companies, we present a slide, they present a slide, alternate like that. The students voted with their feet to come over here. And one of the distinguishing characteristics is first the uh, group here and the quality of the video they produced, and we just had evidence of that last week again, <laughs> despite the train wreck. <laughs> but uh, we've kept our class sizes small. They've let them grow to 70 students. And there's no way, and you, you guys know this, with 70 students in your class, how are you going to pay attention to them as an individual? Right. I think a large part of the students' perceived or perception of quality is the relationship they establish with a faculty member. And uh, 
this thing. But also, did. somebody has to grade all that stuff. That they oh, turn I know. In. And yeah. who's going to do it, that if you tough. have 400 students? I think that a lot of people take the concept that they're taking the classroom to the students. In other words, they're going to open the classroom up and throw it out to everybody. Or where our concept is that we bring the students to the classroom. So we're not bringing in hundreds or you know 80 or 90. We're bringing in what the teacher will be able to sustain. We have limits. We don't just say, well, we'll take as many as we can get. And, and some of that relationship is offline. You know, you get an email or a question from a right. student by email or phone. Did the student wait a week to get an answer, or did they get it the next day? Right. I, I have had, and this is interesting, and, and I think that's where that caliber really goes up. So in the end, you can have a fancy CHD, but it's really the human thing. Mm -hmm. Having that person behind the mirror there is huge, and uh, keeping the class sizes. Yeah. I went on a on a vacation, and I was hosted by one of my distant students. My family was hosted with his whole family in their country. Oh, yeah. Uh, because, because of the personal because relationship. Of the, That's the relationship we established. Back, yeah. And I'm not going to have 40 distance. I'm not going to be able to go 40 back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and I've gone on trips to Peru, Machu Picchu, with, you know, and I meet their spouse. And uh, we also want that relationship. Yeah, and it's not going to happen when you have 400. Yeah, and that's one of the keys. I think USC probably makes more money than we do, but uh, I'd take what we've got any day over theirs. Uh, I was in I was in Florida uh, two weeks ago talking to Lockheed. One of their technical fellows, who, who in that company that's equivalent to a vice president, happened to be in the meeting, and we we're hosting it for other students that were interested. I'd never met the guy before, but he had been through several of our classes, and you couldn't have paid him to give a stronger endorsement. He just went on and on. I just sat there in awe <laughs> and listened. And he wound up saying that he didn't understand why Lockheed had, and we were in that degree, were 104. He didn't understand why they had selected some of those other schools because he looked into them. And it was because. Uh, the relationship that he had established with several of the professors here. Mm -hmm. That the same thing you're talking about. Yeah. I, I didn't want to... Sure. You guys have done a great job. I don't want to step in. I, I'll screw up your presentations if I do. <laughs> and thinking about numbers uh, reminded me that uh, every semester, at the end of every semester, we survey our, our distance students and get that back. We also, at like mid-semester and at the end of semester, we survey our professors as well. And all that information kind of gets tallied together at the end of the semester and we look and we take all that into consideration. And that pretty much, a lot of that information pretty much usually decides what we do, really. I mean, if we had like, you know, huge complaints on one thing, then we're gonna, we're gonna phase sure. it out, sure. you know? And so if we, if synchronous and having both, I should say, synchronous and asynchronous and doing it the way we do, if it had been butchered up and down, left and right, every semester, we wouldn't be doing it. But it's not. And, it, and that's, the, that's the kind of the beauty of it, is hearing that feedback every semester. And a lot of times we, get, we do get complaints on things, but then there are, there are little things that we go in and we, we phase them out, we fix it, or whatever. You know? no, it's, I mean, that sounds, that sounds exactly right on. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, think the thing I add is that it's neat to also then think, I mean, as, as the field of cognitive science grows so exponentially, kind of it's like the next human genome project, right? And so the, the idea of being able to, even using as blunt a tool as something like Myers-Briggs kinds of personality indices, or um, just the idea of well, what kind of student do you have, what do you deliver, and which kinds of students nice. like what you deliver. Now, now you, you take the, you know, you take the, the test of, you know, some Likert scale of what did you like, what did you not like, and you start to translate it into a more, an increasingly data-driven system. Um, then you can actually start to make even you know, strategic ahead of time decisions, marketing decisions, so. And we also survey on-campus students at the end, too, to make mm -hmm. sure that they're um, for, you know, what, you know, what they thought of the room. Mm -hmm. stuff like that. Right. But I, right. Right. And yet you don't know anything about the student other than that they participated in the class, right? So I guess that's where, I, where I'm suggesting it'd be nice to start to know more about 
it, it's, it all comes back to the whole reason why you know everybody's pushing these little like buttons on the, on the net, right? And so that's all <laughs> supposed to be collecting information about what you like and who you are and profiling it all together. And so that you put it in a database and now they're going to mine it and know exactly how to market stuff to you. Um, I guess I'm not maybe talking about it that quite capitalist as, as I'm thinking about it in terms of it's, it's information delivery, but what we're really interested in is education, right? That's why we're all here. So Google just cares about information delivery. We actually care about did, did actually education occur, which is very different than just information. It's much higher in the Bloom's taxonomy of learning than just providing raw information. So um, I, I'd really be very curious what we're doing here that where we're actually measuring those higher functions and how that matches to our type of student. I think those would be, to me those sound like unique things that we might be able to do. Or maybe they're not unique. Maybe everybody else is measuring that as well and the meta studies don't show any kinds of trends. But yeah, I would really have pushed. If somebody had said to me, I can teach 400 or 15 with the same efficiency and I can make more money at teaching 400, that's Show me the data that supports that. Yeah. Well, then right. there, there's also the question, are you actually teaching? Sure. Or are you just spewing information? Right. Are, do you think that those 400 are retaining as much as 35 in right. one class? Ross, do we have a, I just made me think of it, do we have, or maybe Henry has it, the stats on like how many would graduate? Like, through the course. Attention oh. rates. Well, Henry mentioned it a little bit ago for at least one of the programs. He said mm -hmm. that Milwaukee. We were matching I mean, USC in yeah, a program yeah, yeah, that yeah, they. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have that. He, uh, that. he, he made a statement in our, in our the meeting other the other day, and it was since we, in, since, I can't remember what year he said, we'd graduated nearly 900 people, I think was his number. At any one time, any one semester, we have around 600 distance students. And that's the best I can tell you. Mm -hmm. Sizable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about 100 classes? 